welcome to the first whiskey lecture. I'm going to read Emerson's essay, History. And this will be, I'm not going to read the entire essay. This will probably be in two, maybe three. And these will be going up and continued at some point on my Substack. So if anyone is interested in these long form readings and lectures, there will be more of that on my Substack going forth. There's a link to that, obviously, also in the description of this video. Now, these lectures are called the Whiskey Lectures because I'm going to drink whiskey. Tonight, fittingly, a Woodford Reserve Kentucky Straight Rye Whiskey. And I'm going to read Emerson, who's a an exemplar of American humanity. A bit uh, like him, I am a free traveler of sorts, as he was. He gave, I think, up to 80 lectures across the northern United States every year. And he so had a career as a free lecturer. I found a copy of the Portable Emerson, published by Penguin. So this is a used copy I found a few weeks ago at a bookshop in Brighton called Raining Books. And for some reason, I opened this book right with this essay on history. And after reading only a few pages, it became clear that or it, what came forth, really, to me at least, was that I had never, in the English language, read anything by anyone else where the word history was really cast into its own. So I'm now going to read from this essay, and if and when the muses kiss me, I will comment on the essay. There's no great and no small to the soul that maketh all, and where it cometh all things are, and it cometh everywhere. I am the owner of the sphere, of the seven stars and the solar year, of Caesar's hand and Plato's brain, of Lord Christ's heart and Shakespeare's strain. There's one mind common to all individual men. Every man is an inlet to the same and to all of the same. He that is once admitted to the right of reason is made a free man of the whole estate. What Plato has thought he may think, what a saint has felt he may feel, what at any time has befallen any man he can understand. Who hath access to this universal mind is a party to all that is or can be done, for this is the only and sovereign agent. So we hear that having access to this universal mind, to history itself, ipsa historia, is party to all that is or can be done. So there is, from this mind, an opening to actuality and an opening also to possibility. Now let's continue with the reading. Of the works of this mind, history is the record. Its genius is illustrated by the entire series of days. Man is explicable by nothing less than all his history. Without hurry, without rest, the human spirit goes forth from the beginning to embody every faculty, every thought, every emotion which belongs to it. 
in appropriate events. But the thought is always prior to the fact. All the facts of history pre-exist in the mind as laws. Each law in turn is made by circumstances predominant and the limits of nature give power to but one at a time. A man is the whole encyclopedia of facts. The creation of a thousand forests is in one acorn. And Egypt, Greece, Rome, Gaul, Britain, America lie folded already in the first man. Epoch after epoch, camp, kingdom, empire, republic, democracy are merely the application of his manifold spirit to the manifold world. This human mind wrote history and this must read it. Just as a side note, Hegel says somewhere in his philosophy of history, not going to look for the quote. He says, we must suppose that the writing of history and the actual deeds and events of history make their appearance simultaneously and that they emerge together from a common source. So Emerson and Hegel are speaking of that common source, that mind that is Ipsa Historia, that is history itself. The writing of history and the events of history happen at the same time. The Sphinx must solve her own riddle. If the whole of history is in one man, it is all to be explained from individual experience. There is a relation between the hours of our life and the centuries of time. As the air I breathe is drawn from the great repositories of nature, as the light on my book is yielded by a star a hundred millions of miles distant, as the poise of my body depends on the equilibrium of centrifugal and centripetal forces, so the hours should be instructed by the ages, and the ancients explained by the hours. Of the universal mind, each individual man is one more incarnation. All its properties consist in him. Each new fact in his private experiences flashes a light on what great bodies of men have done and the crises of his life refer to national crises. Every revolution was first a thought in one man's mind and when the same thought occurs to another man it is the key to that era. Every reform was once a private opinion and when it shall be a private opinion again, it will solve the problem of the age. The fact narrated must correspond to something in me to be credible or intelligible. We, as we read, must become Greeks, Romans, Turks, priest and king, martyr and executioner. Must fasten these images to some reality in our secret experience, or we shall learn nothing rightly. What befell Astrobel or Caesar Borgia is as much as illustration of the mind's powers and deprivation as what has befallen us. Each new law and political movement has a meaning for you. Each new law and political movement has a meaning for you. Stand before each of its tablets and say, under this mask did my Proteus nature hide itself. So here, Emerson refers to Proteus, the one of the uh, uh, of the water gods, um, sea gods, and uh, someone who, or a god, sorry, who can or will often change his appearance and will also often change direction. So Emerson ties our Proteus nature to history itself and to 
the mind of which or which contains the laws from which we write history so we can write history because we are an instantiation of that mind and also because that mind contains already the laws or what is potentially actualizable in history. So in some sense, through writing history, we approach that protean universal mind. This remedies the defect of our too great nearness to ourselves. This throws our actions into perspective. And as crabs, goats, scorpions, the balance and the water pot lose their meanness when hung is signs in the zodiac. So I can see my own vices without heat in the distant persons of Solomon, Alcibiades, and Catiline. It is the universal nature which gives worth to particular men and things. Human life as containing this is mysterious and inviolable and we hatch it round with penalties and laws. All laws derive hence their ultimate reason. All express more or less distinctly some command of the supreme illimitable, illimitable essence. Property also holds of the soul, covers great spiritual facts, and instinctively we at first hold to it with swords and laws and wide and complex combinations. The obscure consciousness of this fact is the light of all our day, the claim of claims, the plea for education, for justice, for charity, the foundation of friendship and love and of the heroism and grandeur which belong to acts of self-reliance. It is remarkable that involuntarily we always read as superior beings. Universal history, the poets, the romances, do not in their stateliest pictures anywhere lose our ear, anywhere make us feel that we intrude, that this is for better men, but rather it is true that in their grandest strokes we feel most at home. You see, only a noble spirit such as Emerson could write something like this. If you remember, Nietzsche speaks of the critical approach to history which looks back upon history as if a record of only the most uh, criminal elements of everything that has to be torn down and destroyed and endlessly critiqued and criticized. This is the response of the herd to the claim of history. But in Emerson, we find a noble spirit writing and addressing history. All that Shakespeare says of the king, yonder slip of a boy that reads in the corner feels to be true of himself. We sympathize in the great moments of history, in the great discoveries, the great resistances, the great prosperities of men, because there law was enacted, the sea was surged, the land was found, or the blow was struck for us, as we ourselves in that place would have done or applauded. We have the same interest in condition and character. We honor the rich because they have externally the freedom, power, and grace which we feel to be proper to man, proper to us. So all that is said of the wise man by Stoic or Oriental a modern essayist describes to each reader his own idea, describes his unattained but attainable self. All literature writes the character of the wise man. Books, monuments, pictures, conversation are portraits in which he finds the alignment he is forming. The silent and the eloquent praise him and accost him, and he is stimulated wherever he moves as by personal illusions. A true aspirant, therefore, never needs look for allusions personal and laudatory in discourse. He hears the commendation not of himself, but 
more sweet of that character he seeks in every word that is said concerning character, yea, further in every fact and circumstance, in the running river and the rustling corn. Praise is looked to marsh tended love flows from mute nature, from the mountains and the lights of the firmament. These hints, hints, he says, that's crucial, I think, that there are hints left for us in the great records of history and literature. These hints dropped, as it were, from sleep and night. Let us use in broad day. The student is to read history actively and not passively, to esteem his own life, the text, and books, the commentary. Thus compelled, the muse of history will utter oracles as never to those who do not respect themselves. I have no expectation that any man will read history or write who thinks that what was done in a remote age by men whose names have resounded far has any deeper sense than what he is doing today. Emerson here speaks of a muse or the muse of history who will continue to utter oracles for us. So there's a, a Delphic, Apollonian, we could almost say, um, hint here. And an appreciation of these oracles or, let's say, hints and traces is always open only to those who have self-respect. So those to speak with Nietzsche who do not fall into critical historicism, but a monumental one, who uh, live by a monumental approach to history. The world exists for the education of each man. There is no age or state of society or mode of action history to which there is no not somewhat corresponding in his life. Everything tends in a wonderful manner to abbreviate itself and yield its own virtue to him. He should see that he can live all history in his own person. He must sit solidly at home and not suffer himself to be bullied by kings or empires, but know that he is greater than all the geography and all the government of the world. He must transfer the point of view from which history is commonly read, from Rome and Athens and London to himself, and not deny his conviction that he is the court, and if England or Egypt have anything to say to him, he will try the case. If not, let them forever be silent. He must attain and maintain that lofty sight where facts yield their secret sense, and poetry are al and, and annals are alike. The instinct of the mind, the purpose of nature, betrays itself in the use we make of the signal narrations of history. Time dissipates to shining ether the solid angularity of facts. No anchor, no cable, no fences avail to keep a fact a fact. Babylon, Troy, Tyre, Palestine and even early Rome are passing already into fiction. The Garden of Eden the sun standing still in Gibeon, is poetry thenceforward to all nations. Who cares what the fact was when we have made a constellation of it to hang in heaven and the mortal sign? London and Paris and New York must go the same way. What is history, said Napoleon, but a fable agreed upon? This life of ours is stuck round with Egypt, Greece, Gaul, England, war, colonization, church, court and commerce, as with so many flowers and wild ornaments, grave and gay. I will not make more account of them. I believe in eternity. I can find Greece, Asia, Italy, Spain and the islands. The genius and creative principle of each and of all eras in my own mind. And he can find it. Of course, because his own mind is connected to the one mind, to the great mind, which 
inhibit or which in which indwell the potentialities of history and the history that is recounted and told that great fable that is still and always opening up not what was factually but instead potentialities for the future what can be and what still can be done so i think now it's time to take a sip of the wood for it reserve a kentucky uh, whiskey We are always coming up with the emphatic facts of history in our private experience and verifying them here. All history becomes subjective. In other words, there is properly no history, only biography. So you see, just as a comment briefly, what Emerson here shows us is that it's not about subjectivism or so. But that every biography, every, every life that writes itself, articulates itself, is a member of history, is a facet, an aspect of it, and adds to it, contributes to its weaving and striving and its, and its, and its work almost perhaps even to its revelation. So to speak as it has become popular of the end of history is in some strange sense, I think, an absolutization of subjectivism and incapacity by the many to appreciate or access genuine history and to find oneself connected to history itself, ipsa historia in Latin. By the way, Emerson here tears history out of the hands of God very strikingly. It is now accessible to man, not just to God, as it's still Ipsa Historia is only accessible to God, according to Saint Augustine. So we continue. Every mind must know the whole lesson for itself, must go over the whole ground, must, right? So must go over the whole ground. What it does not see, what it does not live, it will not know. This is also important. Even though we can perhaps read everything in an informational sense. This does not mean that we have truly seen and have truly known and have truly understood. It must be lived also. But this living through of history, through biographies or through reading the greats, is, of course, also the life of the mind that is here addressed. What the former age has epitomized into a formula or rule for manipular convenience, it will lose all the good of verifying for itself by means of the wall of that rule. Somewhere, sometime, it will demand and find compensation for that loss by doing the work itself. Ferguson discovered many things in astronomy which had long been known the better for him. History must be this or it is nothing. Every law which the state and act indicates a fact in human nature. That is all. We must in ourselves see the necessary reason of every fact. See how it could and must be. So stand before every public and private work. Before an oration of Burke. Before a victory of Napoleon. Before a martyrdom of Sir Thomas More. Of Sidney. Of Marmaduke Robinson. Before a French reign of terror and a Salem hanging of witches. Before a fanatic revival and the animal magnetism in Paris 
or in providence. We assume that we, under like influence, should be alike affected and should achieve the like, and we aim to master intellectually the steps and reach the same height or the same degradation that our fellow, our proxy, has done. All inquiry into antiquity, all curiosity respecting the pyramids, the excavated cities, Stonehenge, the Ohio circles, Mexico, Memphis, is a desire to do away this wild, savage, and preposterous there or then, and introduce in its place the here and the now. Belzoni digs and measures in the mummy pits and pyramids of Thebes until he can see the end of the difference between the monstrous work and himself. When he has satisfied himself in general and in detail that it was made by such a person as he, so armed and so motivated, and to ends to which he himself should have also worked, the problem is solved. His thought lives along the whole line of temples and sphinxes and catacombs, passes through them all with satisfaction, and they live again to the mind or are now. So we are trying, perhaps more than in previous times, to bring into the here and now, the there or then, to make us accustomed again of the there or then, to not revive it, but to let it enter into that great chain of being, of history. It seems as though this were our peculiar task in this time. A Gothic cathedral affirms that it was done by us and not done by us. Surely it was by man, but we find it not in our man. But we apply ourselves to the history of its production. We put ourselves into the place and state of the builder. Remember the forest dwellers, the first temples, the adherence to the first type and the decoration of it as the wealth of the nation increased. The value which is given to wood by carving led to the carving over the whole mountain of stone of a cathedral. When we have gone through this process and added thereto the Catholic Church, its cross, its music, its processions, its saint's days and image worship, we have, as it were, been the man that made the minister. We have seen how it could and must be. We have the sufficient reason. The difference between men is in their principle of association. Some men classify objects by color and size and other accidents of appearance, others by intrinsic likeness or by relation of cause and effect. The progress of the intellect is to the clearer vision of causes, which neglects surface differences. To the poet, to the philosopher, to the saint, all things are friendly and sacred, all events profitable, all days holy, all men divine. For the eye is fastened on the life and slides the circumstance. Every chemical substance, every plant, every animal in its growth teaches the unity of cause, the variety of appearance. And it is through, I should add, the view of history, the view of history through an appreciation of the universal mind in which we partake, that we can at all also recognize the peculiar, let's say, historicity of even chemical substances or of every plant, of every animal in its growth, to quote Amazon again. Upborn and surrounded as we are by this all-creating nature, soft and fluid as a cloud or the air, why should we be such hard pedants and magnify a few forms? Why should we make account of time or of magnitude or of figure? The soul knows them not, and genius obeying its law knows how to play with them as a young child plays with grey beards and in churches. Genius studies the causal thought 
and far back in the womb of things sees the rays parting from the from one orb that diverge ere they fall by infinite diameters. Genius watches the monad through all his masks as he performs the metempsychosis of nature. Genius detects through the fly, through the caterpillar, through the grub, through the egg, the constant individual. Through countless individuals, the fixest species. Through many species, the genus. Through all genera, the steadfast type. Through all the kingdoms of organized life, the eternal unity. Nature is a mutatable cloud, which is always and never the same. Now, this is a striking sentence. I'll read it again. Nature is a mutable cloud, which is always and never the same. If nature is a mutable cloud, and clouds, of course, come in, let's say, many, uh, many shapes and shades, and constantly are in a state of flux and change, but still uh, there is a coming together. But there also, obviously, a cloud is, if you forgive me, is cloudy also can um, block view and sight, but also can amplify light in a certain direction. Sometimes uh, when you have a very cloudy sky, at times the sun is actually amplified uh, by the presence of the clouds. And again, if nature is a mutable cloud, and genius detects, as he says, through the fly, through the caterpillar, etc., uh, the individual, the species, the genus, the steadfast type, and the eternal unity, then this does not mean that there is utter presence and availability and transparency, but instead that nature still remains ultimately impenetrable and cannot be neatly corroborated but there's still a peculiar unity to her she casts the same thought into troops of forms as a poet makes 20 fables with one moral so here we have it nature and poetry physis and poesis coming together the genuine poet who writes is as much let's say a natural philosopher as a genuine natural philosopher, is a poet. Through the bruteness and toughness of matter, a subtle spirit bends all things to its own will. The adamant streams into soft but precise form before it, and whilst I look at it, whilst I look at its outline and texture, are changed again. Nothing is so fleeting as form, yet never does it quite deny itself. In man we will trace the remains or hints of all that we esteem batches of servitude in the lower races. Yet in him they enhance his nobleness and grace, as Io, in Aeschylus, transformed to a cow, offends the imagination. But how changed when as Isis in Egypt she meets Osiris Jove, a beautiful woman with nothing of the metamorphosis left but the lunar horns as the splendid ornament of her brows. The identity of history is equally intrinsic, the diversity equally obvious. There is at the surface infinite variety of things. At the center there is simplicity of course. How many are the acts of one man in which we recognize the same character? Observe the source of our information in respect to the Greek genius now of course we should not uh, understand information here in the sense that we understand information mm, today but in this old sense of the word it means something much closer to being formed through the greek genius through the deep memory that is history itself through that we find form so it's not to be conflated with 
digitized information or information uh, you know in this rather uh, rarefied sense in which we think of it today we have the civil history of that people a very sufficient account of what manner of persons they were and what they did we have the same national mind expressed for us again in the literature in epic and lyric poems drama and philosophy a very complete form then we have it once more in their architecture a beauty as of temperance itself limited to the straight line and the square a builded geometry then we have it once again in sculpture the tongue and the balance of expression a multitude of forms in the utmost freedom of action and never transgressing the ideal serenity like votaries performing some religious dance before the gods and though in convulsive pain or mortal combat never daring to break the figure and decorum of their dance thus of the genius of one remarkable people we have a fourfold representation and to the senses what more unlike than an ode of pindar a marble centaur the peristyle of the parthenon and the last actions of Phocion. So to go back briefly, Emerson sees an identity, an intrinsic identity and unity in nature, which is the only reason why we can recognize something in her and of her in the first place. And there's also an identity in history that is, as he says, equally intrinsic. And this is how nature and history come together. Physis and poesis, nature and poetry, but also the poetry of history itself. And of course, only thanks to such intrinsic unity, not a unity that is sort of uh, coming from the outside, not a genuine unity, but uh, a totalitarian imposition knows no genuine diversity, of course. It can only proclaim diversity and account for it through empiricistic schemata. But here we have the possibility of a genuine diversity thanks to the inherent unity of history. So I may take another sip now from the from my whiskey, which of course I am drinking straight and not on the rocks. Everyone must have observed faces and forms which, without any resembling feature, make a like impression on the beholder. A particular picture or copy of verses, if it do not awaken the same train of images, will yet superinduce the same sentiment as some wild mountain walk, although the resemblance is no wise obvious to the senses, but is occult and out of the reach of the understanding. Nature is an endless combination and repetition of a very few laws. She hums the old well-known air through innumerable variations. And this again to Emerson is similar in history. Nature is full of a sublime family likeness throughout her works and delights in startling us with resemblances in the most unexpected quarters. I have seen the head of an old sacrum of the forest which at once reminded which at once reminded the eye of a bald mountain summit, and the furrows of the brow suggested the strata of the rock. There are men whose manners have the same essential splendor as the simple and awful sculpture on the friezes of the Parthenon and the remains of the earliest Greek art. And there are compositions of the same strain to be found in the books of all ages. 
What is Guido's Rospigliosi Aurora but a morning thought, as the horses in it are only a morning cloud? If anyone will but take pains to observe the variety of actions to which he is equally inclined in certain moods of mind, in those to which he is averse, he will see how deep is the chain of affinity. A painter told me that nobody could draw a tree without in some sort becoming a tree, or draw a child by studying the outlines of its form merely. But by watching for a time his motions in place, the painter enters into his nature and can then withdraw him at will in every attitude. So Ruse entered into the inmost nature of a sheep. I knew a draughtsman employed in a public survey who found that he could not sketch the rocks until their geological structure was first explained to him. And a certain state of thought is the common origin of very diverse works. It is the spirit and not the fact that is identical. By a deeper apprehension and not primarily by a painful acquisition of many manual skills, the artist attains the power of awakening other souls to a given activity. Now, all the propagandists of uh, AI and other such uh, shenanigans, of course, no longer have the heart and the eyes and the ear for anything like this. These uh, semblance and uh, copy machines, that's basically what they are, they're glorified copiers, will never gain an insight into that deep chain of affinity, into that inherent unity that binds nature and history together. And that also, of course, allows for their difference, for their respective places. It has been said that common souls pay with what they do, nobler souls with, with that which they are. I'll read this again. Common souls pay with what they do, nobler souls with that which they are. And why? Because a profound nature awakens in us by its actions and words, by its very looks and manners, the same power and beauty that a gallery of sculpture or of pictures addresses. It is crucial that this is all being spoken of, mentioned, thought through in an essay on history. Nature, history, literature, poetry, woven together, weaving together. It is not the spirit, Emerson says, and not the fact that it's identical. By a deeper apprehension, I repeat this again, and not primarily by a painful acquisition of many manual skills, the artist attains the power of awakening other souls to a given activity. So for Emerson, art even, let's say, a, a landscape painting is never merely representational, is never merely mimesis, it's never merely the attempt to capture one angle of a certain rock or a certain mountain or a certain uh, forest but instead is deeply always a poetic bringing forth of the relationship between nature man and history you see those postmodernists who just fixate on representation they are either willfully or not blind and ignorant, blind to the beauty of the world that hasn't disappeared, that doesn't disappear just because we have a few video cameras and a few phones that we can take pictures with. 
because it was never about representation in the first place. It was always about something else entirely. Coming in touch again with that deep chain of affinity, which is there, but not simply given. It must be carved out. Civil and natural history, the history of art and of literature, must be explained from individual history or must remain words. There is nothing that is related to us, nothing that does not interest us. Kingdom, college, tree, horse, or iron shoe, the roots of all things are in man. And they are in man because man partakes in the universe, mind partakes in history itself. Santa Croce in the Dome of St. Peter's are lame copies after a divine model. Strasbourg Cathedral is a material counterpart of the soul of Erwin of Steinbach. The true poem is the poet's mind. The true ship is the ship builder. In the man, could we lay him open, we should see the reason for the last flourish and tendril of his work, as every spine and tint in the seashell pre-exists in the, in the secreting organs of the fish. The whole of heraldry and of chivalry is in curtsy. A man of fine manners shall pronounce your name with all the ornament that titles of nobility could ever add. The trivial experience of every day is always verifying some old prediction to us and converting into things the words and signs which we had heard and seen without heed. A lady with whom I was riding in the forest said to me that the woods always seemed to her to wait, as if the genii who inhabit them suspended their deeds until the wayfarer had passed onward. A thought which poetry has celebrated in the dance of the fairies, which breaks off on the approach of human feet. The man who has seen the rising moon break out of the clouds at midnight has been present like an archangel at the creation of light and of the world. I remember one summer day in the fields, my companion pointed out to me a broad cloud which might extend a quarter of a mile parallel to the horizon quite accurately in the form of a cherub as painted over by church, as painted over churches, a round block in the center which it was easy to animate with eyes and mouth, supported on either side by wide-stretched symmetrical wings. What appears once in the atmosphere may appear often, and it was undoubtedly the archetype of that familiar ornament. I have seen in the sky a chain of summer lightning, which at once showed to me that the Greeks drew from nature when they painted the thunderbolt in the hand of Jupiter. I have seen a snowdrift along the sides of the stone wall, which obviously gave the idea of the common architectural scroll to abut a tower. So, I think what he points us to is that the, is that the same architecture or the poem we should not just look to these artworks, but we should look to the contents of the soul, man himself who produced these artworks. And so that there are, in a sense, uh, possibilities still for us to find in the works of man of which history is a record or is the record new forms or forms which have not yet been exhausted. We should not just look to the cathedral as um, as something that is of the past, but instead that is a 
a, a product being brought forth by the human spirit and as that spirit extends across the eons and through memory it also still addresses us we can only recognize a church of old or say a, a, a temple in a foreign land because what we see in it is of course the human spirit and its deep connection to memory so I will leave it at that for tonight I'm going to have a final sip of my whiskey this was the first whiskey lecture I've been reading Emerson's essay history I think there's enough in that uh, essay for a second part of course another 13 pages here in my uh, edition so I'm going to do this in a couple of weeks maybe or maybe in a month or so and these lectures will go on my Substack, and it is there where at some point I will continue um, uh, pro uh, recording uh, lectures such as this one uh, more. So if anyone is interested, do subscribe to the Substack. And if you can, as always, in any way support here uh, the work by, for example, becoming a subscriber on Substack, a paid subscriber, and also by maybe signing up on Patreon and the other, uh, or just by buying a course that is the best way of supporting my work in general. So thank you all very much indeed for listening, and I shall... Be back soon. Good night.